Welcome to the Computer Repair Podcast, episode number 297, Common Business Mistakes. I'm your host, Jeff Halish. This is our live show where we discuss the ins and outs of running your computer repair business. Our show today is brought to you by Instant House Call. Remote support that it's easy for you and your clients to use. You have all the tools you need, including an auto repair feature, which saves you time and money when helping your clients solve their computer problems. Check it out at instanthousecall.com. Use the offer code PODNUTS. All right, let me introduce the co-host. We have the man, the myth, the legend, John Dubinsky from the Maven Group. John, how are you doing? Jeff, I'm bringing sexy back, baby. It's good to be back. Good to have you back, man. We definitely missed you. People have been asking about you almost every week. Yeah, I've heard some of the comments. Uh, I've been listening. <laughs> and believe me, I've reached out to those individuals <laughs> with love and affection. There you go. <laughs> All right. And uh, also joining us, we have James Pinto from Our Nerd. James, how are you doing? I am doing pretty good. Good. Good to have you. And a, no stranger to this podcast who just likes to pop up every once in a while when he has nothing to do on a Sunday afternoon. Adam Carpenter from IT Professionals of Iowa. Adam, how are you doing? I'm good. Glad to be here. Good to have you with his wonderful uh, product placement in the background. <laughs> if only I could get a sponsorship for that. Exactly. Oh. There you go. All right. So, John, I'm going to kick it off to you, man. Do you have a tip or a story for us? Maybe you should have several since you've been gone for the last couple of months. I'm just going to bring my standard tips, Jeff, if I can. I got a couple on the line, but I'm going to hang on to them since I'm going to be on to uh, the couple couple shows coming up here. So I'll just do, I don't know, one to 10. We'll see how that goes. Um, first heads up to everybody, and I got links to the show notes to all this, is do not forget, as of last week, uh, all of us as MSPs are now extremely popular. Since the U.S. Computer Emergency Readiness Team, also known as CERT, has uh, put out a warning that MSPs are now being targeted as part of advanced persistent threats, meaning the bad guys are trying to hack us because we have all of our customer information. There's been a, if you do some Googling, you can find some really high profile MSPs that have been hacked. And obviously that's caused a lot of trouble. So just uh, fire up your two factor, make sure your customer data is secure and make sure you're using applications that are compliant with whatever you need to be compliant with. So there's t my tip number one. And uh, there's a great Calyptix blog that I uh, link to in the show notes and I will put that in the chat. Uh, number two, always a lot of fun with QuickBooks. It seems like that might be in every other show topic that we bring up. So I found an article that is the 10 worst practices that are likely to break QuickBooks. Um, and a couple of these we've talked about before. I won't rehash them all here, but you know, not upgrading, trying to run QuickBooks over a VPN, not closing out of QuickBooks at the end of the day, all those kind of good things. So I thought that was a great tip. And I also thought it was a great uh, link that you could share with your customers. Because, you know, a lot of times we, they don't understand the words coming out of our mouth or maybe they don't believe us. So, you know, sharing that information from somebody else might actually, you know, drive home our points or what we're trying to preach. Um, number three, let's go with the top 10 cybersecurity tools for small business. Obviously, if you Google any of that, or if you Google that, you will come up about with about 5,000 different sites that say are there top 10 security tools. Again, this link is from Calyptix. I thought it was a very good, very brief, very good uh, outline of good cybersecurity tools for good practice. And the reason I put that in there is during my little hiatus while I was getting my mani-pedi and a little bit of a massage, um, you know, a lot of people were reaching out to me uh, just on the whole HIPAA thing and where to start and all that kind of stuff. And my suggestion would be is this is a good top 10 to start with for anybody, whether you have compliance needs or not. So check out that link. That's, I thought that was really good. And it's a simple read. And finally, maybe uh, for the cool side of the week, um, you, have you guys ever heard of statuslights.com? No. It's a really cool site. Um, and what this company has done is, so you're dealing with a customer on the phone and they might say, well, I have an ad trend and these lights are on. Well, they have a list of about, goodness, I don't know, maybe 50 devices which show you all the lights. 
So I'm looking at Action Tech R1408 modem router right now, and it shows me the lights and how they're blinking. And this is also something you could send maybe to your customer to say, these are what the lights should look like, or this is what the device is. So it's statuslights.com. So that might help you with your remote troubleshooting when you're working with a client. And I'm going to stop right there. That's my top four for this week. Awesome, man. Great tips as always, John. Hey, thanks. All right, All right James, uh, what do you got for us this week? Well, uh, short story with a tip. Um, yesterday, or no, Friday, uh, we were changing uh, SIP providers for one of my voice over IP customers. and. Um, Long, long story short, we spent about an hour, me and the SIP provider and the ISP all working on it. Finally decided, well, I'm just going to call Calyptix, see what they say. Maybe we've missed something on the fire or firewall. Gave him a call. And he said, well, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and restart the PBX, and then I'm going to adjust this firewall setting. And as soon as he said restart the PBX, I remembered I had this exact same problem a few months ago, and restarting the PBX fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> so the tip is the first rule of IT is have you tried turning it off and on again? If I had done that right away, would have saved everybody an hour. So don't forget to restart something if it's not working. That is an excellent tip, James. Uh, we run into that stuff all the time because our brains are really running 100 miles an hour. We're trying to fix a problem. We're trying to take care of the customer. And sometimes we forget the simplest things. Yep, so that, that's that's that what I did. That should be a tattoo requirement for all of us. We should all have to get when it dot reboot tattooed yeah. somewhere on it. <laughs> nice John. All right. And Adam, what do you got for us this week? Uh just a quick tip. Make sure you take the time to learn the products you offer inside and out as much as possible. So uh for this example, um, we resell Office 365. And uh, so a lot of times people will bundle third party spam filters and, and those things. Um, but if you go in and look in the Exchange Admin Center, you know, there's options for outbound spam, connection filtering, action center, malware filter, spam filter, you know, all the DKIM, SPF records, um, mail flow, you can block from countries or specific languages. Um, there's limited mobile device options there. Um, you know, and, and myself recently would recommend a, a third party spam filter. And I just started looking into this and most of it's built in. You just have to configure it and it's not that bad. Excellent. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Again, I think you just keeping things simple and uh, trying to keep it all in one box. Or uh, you know one one piece of uh, software or whatever makes your life that much easier. Yeah, it gives you less places to look when something does break. You know, you're not chasing down three different providers. That's awesome. All right, let's see my tip for the week. Actually, I put in a two terabyte SSD in my computer, and I was I wanted I didn't want to spend a whole lot of money, so I actually found a Micron SSD for two hundred eighty eight bucks, two terabyte. And I'm using it as a data drive. Now, for a lot of people, they will think about, you can get a spinning drive, probably a five terabyte drive for that same thing, which I could have. But I decided to, let's try a, even though I knew it wasn't going to be a high-end SSD. And when I did the tests on it, the read-write speeds were not as good as the Crucials or the Samsungs or anything like that. But they were still better than a spinning drive. And so far, it's working the way I need it to. It keeps all my uh, backup data files, podcasts, et cetera, on that particular drive. I have no spinning media in my new computer whatsoever. I have two SSDs and a NVMe drive that basically power this thing. It's whisper quiet and really, really nice. So if you want to check that out, uh, I will put a link in the show notes for the Amazon link. And like I said, it for, for a two terabyte drive, because I know a lot of people will, not a lot, there's a few people out there that say their customers might need some more space. Well, maybe here's a drive that will help somebody out where you don't need it as fast because they're using it as a data drive, which is what a lot of us have been using spinning drives for. Maybe this is something we can move into uh, a new realm. And, you know, if you look at a lot of the chips that are out there on a lot of these SSDs and RAM and et cetera, et cetera, you're going to see the name Micron all the way from basically almost 30 years ago. 
So Micron has been around for a long, long time and they're, they're a standard. Now, again, like I said, I wouldn't use it for a, you know, gaming drive or anything like that. It's not as fast, but then again, it's still faster than a spinning drive. All right. So, um, that will be my tip. Let's take a quick break and then we'll get into our main topic. TechCon Unplugged, September 20th through the 22nd, 2019. I know we keep talking about this. And like I said last week, it's in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And it is going to be a wonderful, uh-huh. wonderful time. Yeah, right where in John's hometown. John didn't even know. We just kind of said, hey, we're just going to do it here. <laughs> I might be able to make it. <laughs> That's awesome. So, um, it, it's a great area. Uh, you know, the downtown area is awesome. We're going to be by the airport and there's a lot of things to do there. You can get around very easily, very, very inexpensive. We got the rooms for one Oh two a night. You, you can't beat it. Uh, you get to travel there, whether it's, you're going to drive or fly, uh, depending on where you're coming from, but it is going to be a phenomenal time and just a good time to share amongst other business owners, other technicians, uh, about things that we do in our business on a daily, weekly, yearly basis. So we're excited about that. We do have somebody working on the website. You can go to, and I'm not sure if it's up and running because we're kind of in this phase. Hopefully within the next week or so, everything will be moved over. But you can go to techconunplug.com and check it out there. Um, if it's not up and running, don't worry. It'll be okay here in a, in a short bit. But if you want to go there and just sign up for the newsletter, Hopefully the new site will be online here shortly and we'll have ticket sales and everything else that you need to order tickets, get a hotel room and get yourself settled for really less than a year away, which is kind of cool. Um, but that's, (laughs) you know, we we think about 2019, we think it's a long way away. It's going to come faster than faster than I want it to. I can tell you that, but, uh, it'll be fun. All right. So check that out. All right, so let's talk about what are some of the common mistakes that we as individuals or business owners have made in our businesses. Obviously, we all have things that when we start off, we might be trying certain things and or we might have lack of information and not know that we need to do certain things. So, I'm going to I'm going to kick it over to John since he's been in business for like forever. And John, if you could go back, <laughs> you'll come that just means I can't remember all the mistakes I've made. So. <laughs> so if you were to go back in the beginning, what's one major mistake that you made in your business that you would go back and start over and correct if you were to start today? Well, I would have probably bought a Xerox typewriter versus an IBM when I first started just to make sure that I was getting a better quality product. But um, no, to be honest, it hasn't quite been that long. Probably the first couple mistakes I made and well, there goes my show notes. Now I can't remember what I was going to talk about. Um, well, I'm going to work backwards because I remember what the last one was. So the last one was, was not standardizing on products. Um, in a business environment, I really think that is one of the primary things that you need to do is standardize on a product just to simplify your life from a, from a both uh, a support, uh, a training, a procurement, and going back to what Adam talked about, mastering the products that you're using. Um, you know, a lot of people might say that a computer is a computer, uh, but, you know, if we just compare compare uh, HP products, business products to Dell business products. I mean, there's a lot of difference when you bring up the BIOS, the settings, the terminology, and just a lot of those things. If we want to even take that a little bit further into networking, uh, a watch guard interface is a lot different than a Calyptics interface, which is a lot different than a sonic wall interface. So I, you know, that's kind of the way I'm uh, uh, breaking that down. Um, you know, not standardizing on a product. Um, and then, I also think you become a master of none. So in my opinion, you should try to pick something, focus on it, uh, not be too committed to that in case you need something that's an outlier to fulfill a requirement, but always trying to standardize and making sure that you're justified if you're choosing something outside of that standardization. All right. That That would be one of the primary ones. That is a good start. All right, James. If you had something in your business when you first started that you would change, 
or what maybe what's a mistake that you've made along the way that you would go, you know what, I'd do this a little different if I was to start nowadays. Um, not saying no enough. Um, I have a real bad tendency to just say yes to anything the customer wants me to do, um, even if I've never done it before. So I think that would be a, that'd probably be the, the biggest thing that I could think of to change is just, just say no. You don't that, have to say yes to everything all the time. Save yourself a lot of headache. Can I yeah, jump but, on your, uh, his coattails too and, and add on to the end of that is not saying no, but also saying maybe no to customers, meaning taking on customers that I knew from the beginning that my spider senses were screaming <laughs> that I should have not taken. Yeah. So if I can add on to the same, you know, just when you get that bad feeling, when you meet them for the first time, or you kind of look at what they're doing or just listening to some things they've said. So yeah, both of those I've, I've been there too, James saying, I say yes too often. Yeah. Well, it's common and it's one of those things we've all been through that because we want to get in there and fix the problem no matter what. And when they go, Hey, can you, uh, move those boxes? Yeah, no, that's not what I'm here for. Or, you know, can you reset up my, my QuickBooks database? And if, if you're not real versed in that, you might either want to have somebody in your back pocket that you can call and pay to come in, you know, or remote in or something to take care of that problem. And here's the thing, you can pay somebody to do that and it's okay. And you can sit there and watch what they do and learn so that if you need to go back and do that at another time, you've got that. So you've kind of paid for education while getting paid and not losing a customer because the customer is still coming through you, even though you're using somebody else. So that makes sense. All right. So Adam, what about you? Same question. Yep. So I'm going to basically tie all of the previous together. Um, from the start, don't set your prices too low. If you don't do that, then a lot of times you'll avoid those problem customers that everybody runs into, um, you know, and also don't take on any job that comes through the door. Now, with standardizing, you can have your standard products, but I've found it's also too easy to say, well, yes, I have these standard products, but okay, well, we're going to support what you have anyway. Uh, so if if customers are not on a business solution, you're not doing anybody a, a service by keeping, you know, like a, a, a off the shelf router or whatever, you know, or, or consumer grade machines, you know. So just because you are, you're, you're standardized, make sure you put that in place. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's and you've got to make those decisions. And a lot of times I think when you're first starting out, you basically you're going to take on legacy equipment from a customer that you need to come up with a plan so that you can basically change that over over time because you can't come to most of your customers and go hey by the way yeah all this equipment is junk and we need to replace it all now and by the way that's going to be ten thousand dollars or five thousand dollars or whatever it is it doesn't really matter what the price is the, the point is for most customers when they see those big numbers it could be a couple thousand dollars to a lot of smaller businesses that's a big deal to them but if you can break that up over a year's time, hey, quarterly, here's what we're going to do. We're going to replace the switch. We're going to replace the router. We're going to replace whatever. Um, you can do that and work with the customer to get it up to the standards that you have. And again, if the customer knows, likes, and trusts you, they're going to be able to see that you're doing it for their benefit. If they don't, eh, maybe, like Adam said, maybe it's not a customer that you really need. Well, and another thing I've done, um, which really goes along with not charging enough, is picking solutions for customers based on price, mm. whether it's the, the what they should have or not. Um, and once you start charging more, you know, you kind of get the mindset, well, okay, so I don't need to provide the cheapest solution. I need to provide the right solution. That's good. That is good. All right. And John disappeared on us. <laughs> All right, James, what other things would you would you think about in your business when you first started that you would probably change nowadays? Uh, charging, charging enough. Um, another big one for me also. Um, trying so hard to get a new client that you'll maybe give them a proposal that's a little lower than you normally would. Um usually ends up making you regretting it for the rest of the time you work with that client. So I think uh, 
I think just, yeah, you got to make sure you're charging enough. Um, if they don't want to pay you for what you're wanting, just move on. Right. I still, I still need to learn that lesson. I'm getting better at that at least I think. Um, but I still do struggle with that too. Trying to trying so hard to, to get a new customer. Another thing is hanging on to customers when the relationship goes bad, you know, not less. So not necessarily that, you know, like John said, your spider senses are tingling from the start. Let's say it, it started good, but then it starts to go bad. Um, I know for us, we held on to one for a year longer than we should have. And it was miserable for both sides. Um, you know, we let them go and, and we did bring them back and it's been great since, but it's not good for either side if the relationship is bad. So, you know, give it 30 days. If, if you can't get it fixed, then it's time to, to part ways. It's not worth your stress because you're going to take that home and, and everybody's going to deal with it. Excellent. John, what's another thing that you have on your illustrious list there? Well, I'll, I'll say kudos to every, what uh, the, the other two gentlemen are commenting on. That's perfect. But um, And I agree with 100%. I mean, when the relationship goes bad, it's time to cut ties. I mean, you'll know that when you get up in the morning and you look at your first appointment and you notice that's the customer you have to go to and you're like, ah, darn. Please take note, Jeff. <laughs> and, uh, and you really don't want to go. So, I mean, yeah, those are wise words from Adam. Um, another hot item, which I think are big mistakes, and this might not be one that we all start at the beginning, but I think it's something ongoing that we all deal with every day is when you're not documenting what you're doing. When you have poor customer documentation, and what that is, is we all run out of time, we're on site, uh, we've got to be somewhere else, so we don't document some settings. Next thing you know, a month later, you're like, oh, crap what was that when the customer's calling you and they're waiting on you to make that change. So then you got to search your brain bucket or go back in or log back into that device to look that stuff up. So poor documentation, you know, spending the five minutes to get it documented when you're doing it is usually a time saver over the time it'll take you to get that information when you really need it. Um, and I am the pot calling the kettle black a little bit because I don't always do it even as long as I've been doing this, but I often find Harmony, peace, and joy when somebody asks me something and I pull up my documentation and it is all there. So, you know, there are some paybacks there. John, Almost me, like winning a lotto. Let me ask you a question there, John. So when you're documenting, let's talk about how we document. Because a lot of people will try to use different things. They will, some people will use pen and paper. Yes, kids, that's the little tablet with yeah, not a tablet. It's like a notepad. With anyways, similar, so pen and paper, or similar to hammer and chisel, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or like using Excel for your accounting. Either way. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I Ouch. Go ahead. Yes. Sorry, Jeff. You're making a great point. Go ahead. Yes. But anyways, so and I know you're in the Google universe where you use you can use Google Keep. You can use uh, usually you have a document set up for each customer. So do you find it easier to jot stuff down on a piece of paper versus going into your smartphone, computer, tablet, et cetera, and actually documenting that stuff there? What's, what would you say is the easier way to do it? Well, first, time, first, my first response is do it whatever way that is going to make you do it. So if that is writing stuff down on paper, hauling that home and reeking it in and at the end of the day, because that's your process and that makes you happy and then you actually do it you now have success. If I start at the beginning of your question, analyze your business, make sure you're dumping all this data someplace that is extremely secure, as I talked about at the beginning, and also meets your compliance needs if you're dealing with any of that too. I would focus on something where you just key it in once and have it everywhere. Um, you know, We're pitching using technology to avoid rework and save time. So whether you're using Google products like I do to handle all of that in my little system, or you're using IT Glue or IT Portal or, you know, the countless other products that are out there for us, you know, just make sure that you're compliant, secure, consistent, and, you know, it doesn't have to be complex. If you're a one-man shop like me, you know, it's easy to control access to those documents because... It's just myself and possibly a couple of customers that need access to that. So that's easy to control that. If you're running a business that has multiple techs, maybe even service employees or others that need access to that data and you need to control user access level to specific information, 
you know, you might be better in a product like IT Glue or something like that. So keep in mind that, you know, the level of complexity you have in your organization is going to directly reflect the, uh, the complexity of your solution. Um, as with everything else, the more secure or complex that uh, solution is, the harder it is to roll out and more consuming and time consuming it is to use. So start with that KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid, and secure, I would add to the end of that. So KISSes, and then move on from there. Perfect. All right, Thanks. James, you had talked about basically charging enough from the get-go. Mm -hmm. and. What, what's a lesson that or a situation maybe that you went through in the beginning of your business where that affected you and what did you do about it? Well, it kind of, it's kind of ties into that and also a not saying no, um, where I did a, a security camera project for a customer, having never done one before. Um, I kind of wanted to do it, which is the main reason I went ahead and did it, but I did not charge them enough for that project. It took me two full days climbing up on ladders, which I hate doing anyway. So that kind of, that was enough of a lesson for me to realize, okay, I'm not ever doing security cameras again. And um, which kind of leads me to the next point is I wish I had found partners to work with sooner. Um, so if someone comes to me and says, hey, I want some security cameras, Instead of saying, oh, yeah, I'll do it, I can say, I won't do it, but here's a good company that will do it. Um, so after shortly after that big project, I did make contact with the security firm. So now anytime someone asks me anything security related, I say, give these guys a call. They can help you out with that. And of course, then they, if they ever run into a customer who needs IT work, well, then they pass them over to me. So um, I wish I had found partners like that earlier on, I could have avoided that whole security camera project I did. I didn't lose money on it. I just didn't make enough money to make it worth what I, all the work I had to do on it. And I'll say this sometimes, and we've all gone through this too. If you want to break into something and do something like add on, I want to do security cameras down the road. And it sounds like you kind of had an interest in this. And here's what I say to people. If you do something, you will find out whether or not you want to continue doing it, whether or not you like to do it. But don't don't forget that when you're going out there and doing some of this stuff and it's kind of a at a so-called loss, you're basically you're kind of paying for education in that sense of the word too, yeah. because you're getting educated about the things you didn't know. And maybe that's not always the best way to do it. Again, they say experience is the best teacher as long as it's somebody else's experience. So a lot of times if you can use another company or somebody and they're available, but also at the same time, don't get stuck in, well, I don't want to do that because I don't have anybody that I know that can help me with that. Maybe you do it a little bit cheaper or you do it at a loss where you can basically learn from the situation so that the next one you do, you can be that much better. And I'll throw on, because I had, I had this on my list too, James, that was great. No one to partner or outsource is on my list. You know, and outsource, I guess I'll jump on that one. You know, I have a lot of partners, but the outsourcing aspect I always go to is maybe you're going to run your own Screen Connect server. Well, just keep in mind that you're going to have whatever you're hosting that on is, you know, you're going to have to maintain that. You're going to have to patch that. You're going to have to update that, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, just make sure you have the time and that's, you know, and, and the effort and the expertise to do that to make sure that that's not a burden or an interference to your business as well. Very good. Adam, what else is uh, on your list there that you can think of that you would change in your business from the beginning? Uh, so one thing uh, would be to keep it as simple as possible. Um, so for us, you know, and as we've had shows before, we're trying to get down to a single pane of glass, which doesn't exist, but as much as possible. Um, so for us, we... Um, all of our documentation is in our ticketing system. So it keeps it in one place. So that does two things for us. One, it's easy to find. Um, and two, it's easy to scale. Because when you bring other people on, it's still all in the same place. You don't have to manage multiple platforms. Um, so try to stay as simple as possible. Don't always um, jump to the next big shiny thing just because it's, it's cool and that's what everybody says to do. Just keep it simple. If the product does what you need, stick with it and... Uh, 
because you can easily get into tools that are too large um, and cost too much, especially if you're starting out and you're not charging enough. You know, the money is a big part of this. Well, and I, and I think in the beginning, too, when you start out, a lot of people forget that you can actually do things manually like most of us have had to do from the beginning. Once you do it manually, you'll figure out the things that you need to the tools and stuff that you need to have to make your business more streamlined. And so I think we need to remember that is just like Adam said, if you've got stuff out there, don't here's the other thing too. The thing I was thinking about was cost conscious. A lot of people will look at these products and services and they'll jump from one to another to save a few pennies. And that to me is just, it, you're totally wasting a ton of time. And a lot of times, what, what do they say? The grass is always greener on the other side until you get there. And I've seen so many people jump ship from one thing to another instead of sticking with what they know and using it to help them make money that they'll go to the new shiny thing. And it's this big ordeal, this big thing that they have to learn. Now, and again, ed, from an education standpoint, that's not always a bad thing. But you've, you've got to count the costs. And I think that's what a lot of people, they just jump without actually counting the cost, whether it's going to cost time, money, experience, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll just add on to that, Jeff, because everybody likes to give me a lot of grief about trying new products. Adam, <clears throat> but um, <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you're going to do that, I always think that's smart. But make sure you're doing it with intention. Don't do it just because it's a shiny object and, you know, like... Um, a good example is when we played with some Outlook.com to maybe possibly fix your email, and it totally blew up on our face. Right. But now we know. And, you know, if nothing else, we learned a ton along the way, but it was intentional. We had a mission. We set out to accomplish it. It didn't work, and we had a way to back out of it. Right. You know, what? I've tried, obviously, some different platforms along the way. One for just research to understand what maybe when I rolled over to outlook.com or, or, you know, office 365 and all that for about a six month period, I did it to determine whether we were staying with G suites or whether I wanted to move over to a hosted platform on Microsoft office. You know, I did that for my email, just my single email in my company, not for the other people that have mavengroup.net accounts and try that out. Or if I'm looking at a new RMM platform, I took a subset of my endpoints and rolled them out to that new platform. So I wasn't that invested and it didn't cost me that much time. You know, so, you know, you, you want to be intentional about the things that you're trying. Um, it, it goes both ways. I always think about this old cartoon that I saw. It, it's a medieval king sitting inside his tent and he's on his way to war and he's screaming, salesman, I don't have any time for any damn salesman. And it's a machine gun salesman outside the tent. So, I mean, obviously, once in a while, there might be those products that might be game changers that you don't want to miss. Just don't chase every squirrel that's climbing up every tree everywhere. So be intentional about what you're doing, I guess would be my recommendation. And John, I think that goes, that's a good point too, is that you can try it. Again, it, it goes back to eating your own dog food. You can try it in your business in, or maybe with one or two customers, like you said, but hey, you want to try something out? Grab the product and try it for yourself and see what it does. Actually dive into it. A lot of times people will grab products and they will just put their customers on it, not knowing a whole lot about it. So, yeah, I like your idea about being intentional. And a lot of times it goes right back to what Adam said earlier is, you know, if you keep switching, you're never going to master anything and you're not going to know what you're doing. And you're really not going to derive the value from that product or find out if it even has that value long term. Also, another thing that we're all kind of doing here, um, eat your own dog food. Use the products you have at your customer sites. Um, for one, it makes it a whole lot easier to troubleshoot when something does go wrong, and you know you know more about it. You know you may replace a product, whether it be software, hardware, whatever, because you didn't think it could do something. Turns out it can, just like the Office 365 we were talking about. You know, it can do these features. So there's no, there's no reason to, or if you know, um, a customer is looking at expanding, you know, you can put the proper device in ahead of time rather than putting something in and then have to replace it in six months because you didn't properly size it or spec it or whatever. That's a good point. A lot of times because of costs, Adam, a lot of people will try to, they want to sell their customer a product or service and they'll go, well, it could be a switch. 
And I know I've, I've had this in the past where somebody might have put in a 24 port switch for five computers. Now I looked at it and I go, here's, here's what all the other companies that came in. Cause I looked at their, what they, what they left. And basically they said, all they were going to do is replace the 24 port switch and set up and yada, yada, yada. I went in there and I looked at it and I go, okay, we don't need a 24 port switch, but you know what? They've also got cameras. They're, they're not plugging into the switch right now. It's on a separate DVR system, but maybe this facility goes to POE cameras down the road. Well, there was only, like I said, five computers plugged into this thing. I didn't need to go with a 24 port switch. I could go with a 16 with partial POE so that if they wanted to expand, they could actually expand in their business and it's not going to cost them anything. It's already there. Again, I didn't just go, Hey, I want your business. I'm going to charge you. I'm going to find the cheapest thing out there just so you'll, you'll take me. Do what I do. Just try to talk them out of using you and, and see where that gets you. Cause usually the, go well, wait a minute he's not trying that hard to to get our business i think we want this guy <laughs> well i had to undo that with another one <clears throat> and i guess it would come down to etiquette or bad behavior you know um i don't know hopefully i've never done this i'll put this link in the show notes in the chat too but you know there's a, a list of things that you probably should never do in front of a customer and if you want to take it back to the beginning or maybe you're not having success in whatever business you're doing but, you know, you should probably evaluate and just look at some of these basic things to make sure you're not doing that. You know, being unprepared, being late, making excuses, uh, bad mouthing competition, spending more time on your smartphone instead of communicating with them. Uh, you, you know, being politically incorrect, uh, you know, complaining or gossiping in front of customers, that kind of stuff. You know, make sure you've got your business etiquette down. It might be one thing after you spend time with a customer and depend, uh, develop some rapport. I don't want to ever say friendship, but, you know, some sort of business relationship with them. And maybe maybe that's the kind of relationship you have with them. But, uh, you know, before you, you know, show up in shorts and a tank top and flip flops, you know, to the client, make sure that's appropriate for whatever that is. You know, maybe that's okay on a Sunday if they're calling you in for emergency work and you're driving in from the beach to take care of them or something like that, whatever that is. But, uh, you know, that's probably not good on the second time you're showing up in the office. So, you know, just mind your etiquette and that sort of thing. Absolutely. And it's one of those things where people have often talked about how do you dress for a customer? And one of the things that I always looked at, and you know, it, this is old old business mindset, but it's basically that you want to dress just a little bit better than maybe what the office staff dresses as and or, you know, or comparable the same. And so you're kind of on that same rapport again. And, and John and I, we, we've talked about this before where, man, when you're going in somewhere, because people, some people will say, oh, you got to wear slacks. And some people go, well, I, I'm crawling underneath desks. Why do I want to wear slacks? I need to have jeans on. And, and jeans and stuff are fine as long as they're not holy jeans with, you know, the, the prepaid holes in them, um, or, you know, you, you put a belt on. So when you're underneath the desk, you don't have, you know, plumber's crack or anything. Um, you know, other than that, you, <laughs> you just want to think about these things. And like John said, yeah, present yourself. Because yeah, if you're a smoker, let's uh, get a little bit of mouthwash in the car. There's no excuse for that. Get a little spray or something because, you know, you might not be you might be meeting a non-smoker that doesn't like that. You know, come on, shave, take a shower. You know, come on. There's some basics here. We're all nerds, but. We can handle <laughs> the basics, right? Most of us. <laughs> you would think it, it doesn't take that much to, to do it, right? A little bit of effort. Like I tell my kids, just a little bit, just a little bit more than everybody else. And you'll go really, really far. Not hard. All right, John, what else you got on your list there? Unmute myself, get back to my list. Uh, you know, at the, at the bottom of my list, the last thing I wrote was getting lazy. You know, I've been doing this a long time. You just got to be careful that you're not getting lazy. Uh, don't take, uh, don't take your customers for granted. Things might be going great in your mind. They're not calling you. Uh, 
Uh, so you're making that assumption that everything is perfect. All right, well, don't get lazy. Show up at that customer, bring some donuts, buy some lunch. If the if it's that good already and it end up, ends up being that it was that good, it's gonna be that much better, especially if that's a good customer. You, they're already happy and you show up and try to make them even happier, you're gonna blow them away. Um, that's also a good way to discover maybe something that's uh, not going well that you don't know about. And the way to do that is uh, if you normally talk to the business owner or maybe the business manager, uh, you know, walk around the office, ask maybe a couple of staff if you're not interrupting them, you know, what can I help you with? Is there any problems? You might discover some new things. So, you know, if you've got all the big fires put out, you know, go to try to, you know, dump some water on what's smoldering, make some of the end users happy. You know, just try not to get lazy. Keep fighting, keep moving forward. Don't stop. So in the end, don't get lazy. That's good. I like that. James, how about you? Anything that any other things that come off the top of your head that you go, yeah, I relate with this or yeah, this is something that I, I probably would have changed. Uh, the only other thing I could think of, I thought of while we're sitting here is um, if you're not incorporated in some manner, do that earlier on. Um, I actually just did that this summer and it was just a whole lot more work than it would have been if I had done it a long time ago. Um, but that's the last thing I've got actually just, just incorporate sooner if you're not already. And you know what? It, it's funny there and it depends on the state. So I can't say this for every state, John, John and I are blessed me in Michigan. It's very, very easy to do. I actually, mm -hmm. uh, I did another corporation just this year and it was super simple, easy, got an EIN number. I think it cost me all of 50 bucks and I was in out, boom, got my paperwork done, went to the bank, got a bank account and got everything set up. No, no issues whatsoever. But yes, I, I definitely agree with that. Now what James, so was it a big process? Did you have to go through somebody else? Did you do it yourself or what did you end up doing? Well, I, I use legal zoom. My okay. brother had used them in the past and said it went really well for him. So I just used them to do an LLC. Um, the biggest pain of the whole thing was getting new uh, 1099s to everybody because um, they all had my personal, my social on all the old ones, had to get all those updated, had to get bank accounts changed, credit cards. So it was a long process doing all that stuff. The actual incorporation part was fairly simple, but it was all the everything you have to do afterwards to make sure things going through the business then instead of me personally, that's, that's what took so long. Gotcha. So you would say basically prepare before you begin. Yeah. Okay. That's very good. All right, Adam, anything else on your list there? Nothing's jumping out at me. Okay. John. Well, a couple of things, I guess, to wrap up what I've been talking about, and I, I probably hit some of the topics the other guys were talking about, too, is if I was going to tell somebody to start out is do not be the low-cost leader. This goes back to pricing. I mean, you know, I don't care if you got 15 guys working for you. You are not going to be the low-cost leader. You don't have enough volume. We all know who that is. It starts with an A, maybe a W. Those are the low-cost leaders in our market. So you know, price yourself accordingly, you have value, you have skill, you know, uh, and on top of that, I would say, take that value, take that skill and be unique, communicate your value. Um, you know, you, I certainly don't know everything. And I think that's my, one of my key phrases is the only thing I know for sure is I don't know everything. So, but um, I know a lot. And so do the guys on this panel and everybody listening, um, they know a lot more about things that I don't know about. So you're unique. You bring your own value. Make sure you communicate that. And, uh, you know, don't have a lack of focus. Um, don't try to be everything to everybody. And I think that encompasses a lot, a lot about what we taught today. You know, determine when you need to outsource. Get standardized on your products. Uh, be narrow on your focus and be good at what you do. Excellent. Period. Let me talk real quick about something that a lot of, because I've seen this in the secret Facebook group and in other groups too, where people will talk about, Hey, when I'm advertising, what are some of the things that I can basically advertise? You know, should I have a coupon? Should I have free in my 
uh, you know, my ad or, or whatever. Should I do free diagnostics? Should I have a coupon? Should I have this, that, and the other? And I will say in the beginning, a lot of people will do this. They will try to get people in. So what they'll have is what's called a loss leader. Maybe you do an inexpensive, uh, you know, you, you could do a free diagnostic. You could do a inex or more uh, inexpensive virus removal, let's say. And what I will caution you against is, and I think we've all done it at a, to a certain extent, is don't. Uh, a lot of that stuff you don't need to do, or at least don't advertise that that's what you do. So again, you could you could pull somebody in, and they come in. The, you're the expert. They want to use your business. You go in. You do a, a bang up job for them, or you're just honest. You go. You know what? Here's what I looked at. Here's what it's going to cost to fix this. To be honest with you, I just go buy a new computer. Maybe it took you five minutes. That is going to be a personal choice of whether you charge for a diagnostic on that. But don't don't say that you give a free diagnostic because a lot of times what that'll do is that'll get the people that you don't want as your customer. And so you you don't want to start that right up front. And the same thing with coupons. If you're going to do a sale, seasonal, back to school, et cetera, that's fine. But do it in a short period of time just to kind of get that business. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about, because we've had a lot of uh, a lot of things about the uh, Google AdWords. People are asking about that. I'm actually going to do a video on basically what your ad should read. And this is a conversation that I had with a couple people in our secret Facebook group asking about, hey, here's what the experts are telling me. Well, I'm going to put all of them to shame and basically tell them how to do it organically, how to do it naturally, how to do it the right way without playing any games. So you got you to gotta watch out for those things. A lot of times we look at, th at the way other people are doing things. And just because it's working for them doesn't necessarily mean that where we're at, it's going to work for us. So we've got to weigh those options. And there's just a lot of things that when you start in the beginning, you're going to be tempted to do. And here's the thing. We're going to sit here and tell you, hey, here's some of the common mistakes. Here's some of the things that you want to think about before you do. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to still go make those same common mistakes because you got to figure it out for yourself. And that's okay. But hopefully. Once you heard the things that we've talked about, you'll go back and go, oh, yeah, I wish I would have listened. <laughs> and like my kids tell me, they go, you know, Dad, I know you're probably going to say I told you so. And I said, no. I said, I'm not going to say I told you so because I already knew what was going to happen. And it's, it's just the way it is. It's okay. You'll, you'll learn from somebody's experience, whether it's your own or somebody else's. And I'm fine either way. But anyways, all right. Any other lasting thoughts on anything that's coming to anybody's mind on basically common mistakes that we've made as we wrap up? I'm going to give everybody just a, a couple minutes. John, I'm going to kick it off to you. Well, I would start out maybe just to swing back on your marketing comment. Um, I do very little marketing now. Everything I do is word of mouth. But I can remember back in the day when I was trying to drum up business uh what is it called valpac or whatever we put a, oh, yeah. a one hour one hour free coupon in valpac and i tell you what i i don't remember what if that was a monthly or how often that came out but for that one period we got swamped i mean and we i mean it was like oh my gosh valpac it's you know it's the holy grail for us all right so we jumped on board did the exact same mailing to the same area the next time and expanded to like four or five other areas in crickets the next minute, Didn't, maybe got, I mean, we went from like a 30% return, which is unheard of in a direct mailing campaign to maybe a 5%. And uh, we sent out maybe 50,000 more coupons or something. I mean, we spent a lot of money just based on that. And that's back when I had a couple of guys working me for, I mean, we thought we had hit the Holy Grail. So I guess, uh, you know, mistakes you make, there's no right or wrong in marketing. Just, you know, you got to be careful on where you're spending your money, how much you want to spend. What works one month may obviously not work the next. So there is no direct answer on exactly how to get a new client or, or what you're going to do. A lot of that has to do with the consistency of your message. And maybe in my opinion, of getting a little bit lucky. But, uh, you know, just keep that in mind when you're doing your marketing. That would be my last two cents. Awesome advice. All right, James, what about you? 
Um, I guess um, don't focus on the mistakes. Just move on. When you make them, just realize you made it and try not to make it again and just move on. Well, and here's that's a very, very good point. And I think here's what a lot of people forget is that when somebody makes a mistake, I don't look at it as, Hey, I've lost something. I've made a mistake. I, you know, I, I'm, hey, woe is me. I look at that as an opportunity for me to learn. And if, as long as I learned the lesson and learn from that example and, and go and fix it, then it's not a loss. It's actually a good thing. And so, yeah, I'm with you. Don't definitely don't get down in the dumps. Oh, I can't believe I just did this. Hey, just go, you know what? It happened. Next. Real simple. All right, Adam. Well, mistakes are investments. Ooh, I like that. Mistakes <laughs> are investments. There also, you go. Also, um, marketing isn't overnight. It's the long haul. Make sure you're in it and make sure you understand that. Awesome. Yep, just you like know, stocks, right? Yeah, well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Um, yeah, if we're not in this for the money, we just do this for fun. Right. Exactly. It's not anything better to do. <laughs> Oh, that's or awesome. something else, but I can't remember. All right. So I think that kind of answers those questions. And hopefully everybody's gotten a little bit of something from this and we can recall the things that we've done. And if anybody out there has made any common mistakes in their business, go ahead and email us podnuts at podnuts.com. And we'll read those on the air so that we can get an idea of maybe something that we didn't talk about that somebody else is, somebody else has gone through that would help the community out there as a whole. So, all right, let's go ahead and let's take a quick break. And uh, I think we got a couple of emails. If you would like to support this show, I encourage you to go to patreon.com forward slash computer repair podcast. And what that does is that gets you into the secret Facebook group. Yes, I know some people don't like Facebook, John, but it's where everybody's at. So it's where we've, we're building our community. And it is a nice place where nice people can actually help you with answers. You can ask questions and it could be the simplest question in the world. It doesn't matter. Nobody's going to make you feel stupid because if they do, the enforcer, Paco LeBron and John Dubinsky will boot you. Um, <laughs> we're, we're serious about that. And so we wanted to create a, a place where people could come and share and have you know a good camaraderie and just uh, uh, get help in your business, and that's why we want to do that. Also, it uh, it helps us get things for topics and stuff for the show and and whatnot. So that's it's all good. I want to thank our newest Patreon supporter, Phil Griffiths, and he was on the show. Uh, I think was it last last week, a couple weeks ago. I can't remember. Time flies. Anyways, uh, Phil was on. I think it was last week. Uh, him and Ann and. Uh, he wanted to become a part of the secret Facebook group. So he is our newest Patreon supporter. And I want to thank all of our Patreon supporters for your continued support. Really appreciate what you're doing out there to make this show continue on in all its uh, glory. <laughs> it was on last week. Uh, for those of us that listened, we know. Oh, he's posting in the chat right now. Correcting you. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. I was there, but I wasn't there. No. Uh no, I, I was pretty sure. But anyways, all right. So let's go ahead and go into our, uh, let's see, email. All right. This, okay. This is the first time I've had to wait for a show. <gasps> I've been listening to old ones, mostly when I take my daughter to where she rides horses in Shelby Township. Oh, here in Michigan. Half hour ride each way, more with traffic. So two plus hours out of my life each day. Woo. Man, that's a lot. Uh, how many shows? Gotta you love our about? kids. Gotta love our kids. Oh, that's right. Okay, so he he says that and appreciate that. Last week's email, somebody had asked about how do you uninstall Windows 10 apps? And I'm going to ask you guys here in a minute, but here's what he came up with. He says, I've been using Revo Uninstaller for years to get rid of the junk left behind when you uninstall via Windows Installer or uninstaller. The paid version lets you uninstall multiple pro programs at once, including Windows apps, which I own a version. I, I own this and I do use it for uninstalling multiple things. I have not used it to uninstall the Windows app. So I'm definitely going to check that out. 
Also, John, like this, UVK has a smart uninstaller that can do multiple at once, too. All right, so uh, let's see. Oh, he's and he also mentioned, he said, you mentioned you sent in a copy of your price list. I'd love to see that if you don't mind, and I don't. Um, I'm pretty much an open book. I believe you said on prior podcasts that you, you would share your contracts, et cetera. If we prove we brought, bought the tech nibble kit. Yes. Uh, so he attached his receipt for that. And I sent that out. Uh, full disclosure. This is what I want to get to. I am close to you, but won't, but we won't compete. I don't want to drive more than five to 10 minutes either. So I don't want customers in Canton, just like you don't want ones in Farmington Hills. Thanks in advance, Eric Exton. And he's a brand new Patreon supporter. Um, and what I sent him back was I sent him all the information that he asked for. And then what I sent him, I said, listen, I don't really believe, and I say this, I don't believe in competition. And the reason is, and a lot of people still, I still hear it out in the industry all the time. Competition, competition, competition. It's like, there are different people that will relate with you or your technicians that won't relate with me and vice versa. That's just kind of how it works. Yes, maybe there's a little bit of crossover, but really the reality is there's not competition. I'm not worried about somebody. If there's whatever, 40,000 people in an area, that's way more than I can handle. So I'm not handling all 40,000 people. There's got to be other people that, that can handle those too. So anyways, um, but I appreciate uh, you getting back to us on that. Do you guys know of anything that would uninstall the Windows 10 apps, especially, and I was thinking about this after the question was asked last week, Windows 10 Pro should have none of this crap in it. Is there anything that uninstalls Candy Crush, uh, any of these products, uh, the news feed, all that kind of stuff that you guys know of? Well, so I've kind of given up on it because i just figure in six months they're just going to release a big update and it's all going to be back anyway so i when it comes to windows 10 i just i just let it go now okay i'm in it from the start menu maybe but that's about all i do okay i do the same thing i do it manually john uh uvk will do it they have a smart uninstaller and fred has an uninstaller for the windows 10 apps he also has underneath his registry tools section a checkbox where you can help prevent, it doesn't 100% do it, but will help prevent the reinstallation of those apps as well. Ooh. Also, in the next release of Windows 10, supposedly, so that would be next spring, um, they're going to let you uninstall a lot of the uninstallable apps that are there now, like mail, calendar, all that kind of good stuff, supposedly. Okay. So, so I, would go much... back to my, I would go back to my friend UVK and say... Thanks, Fred. Awesome. That is really cool. Yep. And I own that product too. So I will definitely get on that. So there you go. You got two products that you can use. Adam? So I've tried the PowerShell scripts. I've done Revo. I've done UVK. Like James said, they just keep coming back. So I pretty much give up as well. But to add on to what John said, if they're going to let you uninstall some of that stuff, what's the next thing they're going to automatically remove for you? They've already tried documents. That didn't work out well. <laughs> you know hey have you gone uh, adam have you gone in under the registry tools under the more tools and check the box that says prevent the reinstallation I have, I have not and i will be looking at that that is a super secret yeah that is that is high That's five it's good. worked very well for me nice very good and i will tell you i when this last release of windows 10 came out and they said that documents were missing I partially panicked for a second until I figured out exactly what was going on because I have multiple hard drives. So I was one of those people that was moving my documents folder, my video folder, my music folder to a secondary drive. Well, it sounds like what had happened was people had moved their stuff over and never double checked to see what was in the original folder. They never moved that stuff over in inside windows. You, when it says my documents are just documents, you're not really sure which one it's coming from unless you're looking at the whole tree. And so it was one of those things where, yes, it happened, but it was in this weird case scenario. It shouldn't have happened whatsoever. But at the same time, this just shows me that either technicians or individuals themselves did not make sure that their stuff moved over. And you got to double, double, 
double, triple, quadruple check this stuff to make sure that you're, if you're going to back up data, you're going to move it from one machine to another. You're going to move files around. You got to make sure that you got it. And it leads so several different always, places. I've always wondered in my mind, <clears throat> you know, as simple as it is, how what Windows does is better for end users overall. Meaning, so you click on the documents folder. Well, that might be showing you documents from like five different locations under the documents folder. And that's not clear to the end user. Now, as no. a technician, you should know that and all that kind of stuff. And I can understand it from a convenience aspect, but a user doesn't know that, meaning from the aspect of securing and protecting their data, which you would, I would say would trump usability and easeability, you know, easeability, usability, uh, whatever that is. So, you know, anyways, I digress. Windows should not have, no matter what, should not have gotten rid of those, those files. You have files on your computer. They should not get rid of them. That's, you know, especially that's the stuff that you put there. So that's, I mean, that's a big thing on their part, but yeah, I, they do make it. And I'll tell you the other thing too, when windows eight came out and they had the one drive or whatever they were calling it back then. And that was set up by default. Like when you would save a document, it would go into that one drive folder instead of staying on the computer. And that was, that's confusing. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean. This could be a whole show about I know. what not to do. I mean, it may, if, when, if it's confusing for us and that, you know, folder redirect. Well, first of all, let's go back to your main point. No, nothing should ever delete the data unless it's me clicking and saying, yes, delete that data. Correct. So, I mean, obviously, 100% agree with that, no doubt. But confusing the end user as to where exactly their data is stored and how they're supposed to protect it and where that data is. I mean, that doesn't seem like a good idea either, but. We'll do that next week. You know, and John, now let me ask this because this brings up a good question from a business standpoint, which all of you guys are, are doing business out there from a business standpoint, we've often talked about a lot of people are carrying around laptops or they have these small form factor desktop computers. Maybe they don't have big drives in, them. you know, 250 gig, maybe even 120 gig for a lot of people for what the documents and stuff that they keep email, et cetera, is good enough. Yeah, I look at, I came from a standpoint of my first drive was a 10 gigabyte drive on a 1999 Dell computer. And I thought, I'll never fill this thing up. And here we are. So as, as drives started getting a little bit bigger and getting a little more expensive, what would end up happening is I was buying extra drives and I was, I was having double drives. And then I would move my documents folder and my videos and all that kind of stuff over to a secondary drive and had my operating system just on the main drive. Well, I hated doing that. Well, now we go into this whole realm where we've gotten into these SSDs and they're so expensive. I mean, the prices are coming down, but in order to get a decent sized drive, you know, 500 gigs for me is not going to do it. Not with the video, you know, pictures, videos, different things I have just of my family and whatnot. That's not going to cut it for me. I had to go to three, not two, three SSDs on his computer in order to make it work for me, which I hate. I would just love to go back to the old days. Yes, I know this sounds old and curmudgeon but I would like to go back to the old days of having just one drive on my system and everything's right there. It's easy to manage. It's easy to make your, your file trees exactly the way you want them. I, you really got to become a, a almost a, a master of being able to figure out where to keep your files and whatnot. Well, you're going to have to spin your AdWords back up and get one of those 14 terabyte SSDs. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Who, who said that the other day? There was a I, 14. Ter that'd be awesome. That would be awesome. Well, and then you got the whole backup solution. You got to provide for that. You know, if you fill it. Exactly. It, you know, the thing is across three drives, probably my most filled up drive right now is my games drive, which is a terabyte. And I probably got 800 gigs on that because these games are humongous on my, just my regular backup stuff. You're looking at probably seven, 800 gigs that I'm basically backing up as far as personal data, but that's a lot. Now your average, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, your average consumer or business owner does not have their, their, for business needs, they don't keep all this stuff on their computer. I got a question about OneDrive. Shoot. 
Uh, so like in Google Drive, you know, that, that's where majority of my stuff is. I have the power of Google search. And I know you can do Windows search, but let's not talk about that. If I go on the, <laughs> because we know, anyways, I'm just, I digress. So I'm on, on the web and I go to OneDrive.com. Let's say I've got 500 gigabytes of data in my OneDrive. Can I search from OneDrive.com and find a file name slash or the contents of a file from OneDrive.com? Ooh. I know Anybody? SharePoint does that, and it uses the same sync tool, but I don't have too many people using OneDrive, so I'm not sure. I, You know what? I do not know because I use it for, I mean, basically, my OneDrive folder has stuff that I need shared, you know, maybe some documents, books, et cetera, PDFs and whatnot. And then I keep all my, my business documents on OneDrive as far as, where I keep my information tools, et cetera. So I can get it from any computer, whether it's my laptop, my desktop, somebody else's computer, I can pull that stuff down. Um, that's a good question, John. And I will look at it this week and I will report back because I really don't know. Well, you know, if only there was some place we could do a search to find this sort of thing, you know, mm -hmm. and, I <laughs> and I found the link and I don't remember who said that. Kudos to whoever said that earlier when we were before the, <laughs> before the show. But, um, you know, I, you can find lost or missing files in OneDrive. You know, it's a, when I Google how to search OneDrive. Yeah, but I'm not looking for a lost or missing file. You know, I'm just using, you know. So let me know what you find out and report back to me next week, will you, Jeff? I, I will. And I tell you what, the other thing that irritates me, try deleting something out of OneDrive. Oh, my gosh. So every computer that I have in my office, laptop, bench, desktop, et cetera, Everyone that I log into my OneDrive so I can share all those files and folders. When you delete something, number one, it goes into the garbage can on all the computers. Number two, there's a lot of times where it won't delete the file, so it, ex it actually ends up coming back down. So it is not a perfect system whatsoever. It is a flawed system, and so I am, again, I'm trying to use it for my use case scenario, but I don't keep everything there. And every, everything's okay. backed up too. So I got Napa Valley screaming at or screaming at me, yelling at me, talking to me, chatting with me from the chat room, saying yes, yes, you can. Um, I'm gonna. My question is, like in G Suite under uh, Google Drive, you know, it'll actually search the contents of the document, so not just the file name. Mm. So, I just okay. tested it actually on my. <laughs> I do this one time. Bring in value. Bring in value. Live so, on the show. I searched for Calyptics and I have all my documentation there and it found it found all my documents, all my spreadsheets for customers who I know have Calyptics devices in that spreadsheet. So All right. Well, High five game. Thanks. And, and shout Excellent. out to Napa too. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Excellent. So if people didn't know, a similar function, um, Repair Shopper will do the same thing in their search. So I knew I did something the other day or somebody had asked something on Facebook and uh I knew I had had that situation, so I put in keywords into the search, and it brought up the ticket where I had listed the fix in there. So you can do that there as well if you didn't know. Oh, awesome. Good to know. Excellent. All right. I think we are – that was it. Again, uh, enjoyed having the panel with us today. Tell you what, let's go ahead and from my left to right, we're going to go with Adam. Let people know where they can find you and – uh We'll kind of move sure. on. Uh, one quick thing. Um, so thanks, John, for that uh, tip on UVK. I pulled it up and found a whole section I didn't know about. So I got to dig into that further under tools and tweaks, registry tweaks. It looks like uh, disable auto installing unwanted apps is what we're looking for. Um, there are a lot of tips in there that I like. There are a lot of things I check on every PC in there that I really like. So, yep. yes. So, yep. Go ahead. Uh, I'll start going through there. Um, and you can find me in the uh, secret Facebook group. I'm there quite a bit or support at itproiowa.com. Awesome. Appreciate you coming out even at the last minute. So, yeah, appreciate you hopping in there. Uh, and James, if you could let people know where they could find you at. Well, they can find me in the Facebook group, too. I'm not in there super often, but I do check it out every once in a while. Uh, where you can go to my website, contact me there. It's rnerd.com. All right. Awesome. Appreciate having you come out and sharing with us today. And John? Serenity Now 
And for those that are listening that know what I mean by that, uh, that's a that's kind of a reference to a different show and using my water pick to clean my teeth. So I'm at John at mavengroup.net. Yes, I will keep my Facebook account until I can convince Jeff to switch to something else. And it's good to be back. <laughs> it's awesome to have you back as usual. We definitely missed you. All right. Come join us live for the Computer Repair Podcast every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern over at podnets.com forward slash CRP live. Join in on the conversation by hanging out in the chat room. We've got a lot of action in there today. You can send an email to podnets at podnets.com. We always appreciate the emails, good, bad, or indifferent, asking questions, et cetera. Or you can leave a voicemail if you want to have your voice right next to ours, 734-335-1000. I want to thank everyone for listening and subscribing to the show. We'll see you next time on the Computer Repair Podcast.